what's up next? What what is kind of motivating you nowadays? Yeah, man. Well, I'm still trying to get through the latest one that I've done is called the Nano Pano, um, and that's basically a half frame, uh, one twenty format camera. Interesting. Uh, you, all you're doing is shooting two panoramas onto a six by six sized area on the film. You know, so instead of cycling through twelve six by six frames, you're going through twenty four uh, twenty four by fifty six. Yeah, so you get a nice little panorama, 24 panoramas out of the little camera. So it's pretty cool. YouTube, what's good? Welcome back to the channel. That excerpt right there was from one of our latest podcast episodes. Full episode link is down below, and you can check it out on all major platforms. And don't forget, if you want to support us, you can go ahead and cop some easy 400 black and white film. It is on sale now for $6. Link down below as well. All right, let's go ahead and check out the rest of the episode. So it's just to clarify there, when you're advancing through the film, you kind of stop at one six by six frame, and then you take two individual photos. Yeah, yeah. So here you, you can one see on it on here, but, but there we you go. can explain it to to the viewers. But yeah, so you'll have two windows that are spaced apart enough so that you know just put your first frame through the and first they're on window, top of each other, and they're on top of each other. Yeah, right. and then they're just spaced r just right so that when you move it to the next little window here, the frame will be where you need it to be. Yeah, and that's the Very frame cool. on the inside is that panorama. Yeah, yeah. Frame up in there, so. That's yeah, awesome. so this is it right here. This is the Nano Pano. Um, it's currently in production and getting that out. Um, so that's the right now. Uh, but in the future, I've got this. I don't know if you saw this one yet. I just shot it at Policon. This is the big wide. Oh, wow. Describe um, that my, part for the listeners. Yeah, this is my homage to the Polaroid Big Shot. And the Polaroid yeah. Big Shot is this long uh, cannon of a camera that was used by Andy Warhol. Um, everybody knows it as, as that way the most. Um <laughs> Um, so a lot of people do modify the big shot um, and I get requests all the time. Can you do mod for the big shot? Um, but it's really hard to do something that could be easy DIY. And that's where I try to stick to. Yeah. Even with how I design, I could get really complicated, but I try to make it so that someone else at home can actually build one um, mm -hmm. other than me. Um, so that was the thinking behind this thing is how can I make it really simple for someone to make themselves um, something that emulates that big shot, um, yeah. but then uses a large format lens on the front and a Lomograph lock back on the back. That is amazing. Um, and you shoot, uh, it makes it a portrait beast. So yeah, Policon did really well. Um, I shot all my friends and some legends out there. Um, nice. And if, if you haven't seen that that reel yet, uh, you could see what some of the examples look off look like off of that camera. What's kind of your goal there with these cameras? Because I, I see some really cool stuff that you're creating where just the lens and a box that fits, you know, four by five and you're off. You know, I'm curious. Well, what are you thinking there? Yeah, I think it's just um, I, I try to stick to uh, cameras that are solving a need for myself because uh, I feel like if I don't do that, if I just go by what I think, oh, I think this is going to sell. So gotcha. I'm going to start making this camera. I don't think I'm going to come up with as much of a something that I'll be proud of. Um, so um, I think instant was just the main thing that I was shooting. But I did go back to medium format. Um, because mm -hmm. I think my next my next camera was when going back to that Mamiya Press system is all right. I already took the lens and then slapped that onto an instant camera, um, which you could already already have done the other way around is modified an instant camera to add, slap it onto the Mamiya Press. Yeah, yeah. But but I'm I'm going compact here, right? So that's really when you look at all my stuff. That's really how you look at it. Is I'm trying to go light, compact because I'm taking these things out with me on travels, on hikes, or camping, right? So that being said, I have this huge um, Mamiya Universal. Um, which I love as it is, um, but you know, not for taking it with me up a up a mountain all the time. <laughs> uh, so how do I get that smaller? Um, and so then I basically made a replacement body for the Mamiya Universal that just um, takes that lens and puts it onto the roll film back. Um, so then it's brought me into. Uh, I did go back into uh, instant insects wide mm -hmm. uh, because the Loma Graph Lock came out. So exactly. that was a big thing that came around that kind of changed the game for for me. I was just like, man, I, I, even if I don't sell these things, this is just yeah, for me, yeah. you know? Because I, I was tired of modifying the ma uh, the manual process of unscrewing everything off of an Insects Y300. Exactly. Taking all the electronics out, doing more resoldering, um, drilling. There's some drilling that you got to do to get the, the ejection right and all that. Um, so I was done with that. You know, I was just like, wow, the, the Loma Graph Lock lets me focus on just making a nice, sleek body and then just slapping it onto that thing and then just attaching a lens on there as simply as possible. Um, without much obstruction. Yeah. A little different. I feel like your your cameras have a big emphasis on zone focusing, um, which I think is right. a really good thing because it forces people to learn. Like if you want to learn photography, get yourself a manual camera that is lens driven and requires you to think. Like it yeah. makes a huge difference. 
Yeah, I mean, I and that's that's how I really sold. Uh, that was one of my pitches for the mods early on. Um, I mean, was looking at because a lot of people were going to be intimidated by that. That was one of the big challenges that I had is people are like, "Does it have a meter? You know, or does it have autofocus?" I'm like, "No, nah, I'm <laughs> sorry, dude, I can't. I'm not that good. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to invent, invent all that and try to put in a 3D printed body." But so I try to pitch it to people as, "Look, take look at this as a tool that can help you with your exposures and building that muscle memory." Um, mm -hmm. You can walk soon. You'll be able to walk into a scene and be and say, "Oh, I know exactly what is ten to fifteen feet away, and I know that right now it should be at f sixteen one five hundredth." Exactly. You know, and that's what instant photography helps you do. I feel more so than roll film because um, you'll have to take really good notes and have to have a really good memory so that when you process that roll, you remember what was happening. Whereas in an instant photo, you correct mm -hmm. right on the spot. I've heard mm -hmm. some people complain about three D printing as not being good enough for creating cameras, um, which to me is very puzzling. But um, I'm curious, like from your point of view, where we are now with the technology, like 3D printing seems like a super legitimate way to create a long lasting product. Like, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just because it's it's not that so much has changed in 3D printing. Like when people say that, you know, it's improving um, and things like that. Um, I think what's improving is there are some things that are improving, but what's improving a lot is just people's settings in general. Um, I gotcha. think it's it's relatively easy-ish to just start up with a printer and then start printing something and have something that looks okay. You know, and I think a lot of people don't go too much beyond that uh, to to make sure how well yeah. it works. Um, light sealing is probably the biggest thing that's most important to three D printing. So mm -hmm. most mo most materials that are available to three D printing are are not fully opaque. Uh, so you do have to do some sort of uh, painting on the ends, flocking on the inside to make sure they don't light leak. Um, so that adds more process on there. But, but you know, you can't be really good about where you paint inside of the body in every single inch. So a lot of people do end up with a ton of light leaks. So yeah. that's one aspect of it. You know, I mean, there's just so many different things in, three, in the 3D printing world um, that can impact uh, an item that you make and, and decide whether it's going to be good enough for photography or not down to how thick the lines are um, just for, for you. And for those that don't know what, what 3d printing basically is, it's, it's putting melted filament through a hot needle nozzle and then just squirting it onto a surface in layers and just the nozzle moves around squirting it on in layers and layers. So you know, both the thickness and the width of that layer, as you're laying it down can determine how thick that is, right? Like much like if you're building a house, Right. So yeah. it's so I, I feel like right now, uh, or at least early on, a lot of people were building houses with like a one inch wall. Right. And then like a cardboard roof, you know, when you got to think about it deeper than that, you know, the, the wall has to be a little bit thicker than that. The roof has to be a little bit more solid than that. Um, the materials you're using, you got to stop using cardboard to build your house. You got to start using, you know, <laughs> stone and wood and that, and that sort of thing. But it's but it doesn't didn't mean you couldn't build a house. Right. You could still build a structure. And I think that's kind of where it's been. It's you could 3D print stuff and you can make something that looks okay, uh, but now you got to take it to the next step and, and you know, dial in your settings. And, and at the same time, the quality too is another thing that people look at. Um, making something that's less obviously 3D printed, um, that is something that has been improving with some of the algorithms on, on how the machines decide how to, you know, basically melt the plastic. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it really is all code driven. Yeah. Nothing that you need to know because there's the software does that all for you. You just put in your model, hit the button, and it spits out the code for you. But that part of it, the back end, the engines that are driving all this code generation is just uh, that's where a lot of improvements are happening too to help the quality side of it. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, click like down below and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and to the podcast. Links down below for the podcast as well. All right. Y'all to the next episode. I'm out.